Hello and welcome to the next uh, session on post-colonial literature in English. And we continue with Caribbean literature following White Sargasso Sea. We are not now going to focus on another very famous work of Caribbean literature and that is Derek Walcott's Omeros, right? So the very famous poem Omeros written by Derek Walcott. Now before we go on to the text, a little bit about the author Derek Walcott and he's quite a well-known name in post-colonial literature, world literature and of course Caribbean literature. He's born, he was born in 1930 on the island of St. Lucia north of Venezuela and he's raised in a Methodist family. So my, uh, Methodist uh, are a minority in St. Lucia which is which constitute the majority of the population is uh, Catholic, are Catholic Christians and Methodists are a minority and he is raised he comes from that method uh, from one of the Methodist families in St. Lucia and uh, with a with a with a kind of mixed descent English French and African ancestry so a mixed heritage that passes on uh, that is passed on by the family to Derek Walcott and his siblings like Roderick Walcott, his twin who was a famous painter at the time. Now Walcott starts writing really early. He makes his debut with a collection called 25, poem, 25 Poems in 1948 at the age of 18. He's already, by this time he's already been publishing in magazines and so on. But the first collection comes out at the age of 18. And he reads and is, he's inspired by poets like Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, so high modernist poetry, that is what influences uh, Derek Walcott. He studies as a scholarship student at the University of West Indies, that was the first university in the Caribbean, so he did not follow the Windrush generation going to England for education or even going to America for education. He studies in West Indies. He works as a teacher and journalist and as he continues to write. The first major success came with the collection called Green Knight in 1962. He, he also wrote um, play, uh, plays like Dream Monkey in 1971 and of course then 1990 is Omeros. So when he writes Omeros, he already has a substantial amount of work. He's already an established poet and a writer at the time. So Omeros is not a work of a new writer. He already has an established, he already has established a name for himself. And in 1992, he wins the Nobel Prize in Literature. Now what are the major themes of Walcott's work? Uh, the, the first and foremost is the Caribbean, the Caribbean islands, the colonial and post-colonial history. And this is linked to his own mixed colonial heritage. So he explores the mixed colonial heritage and post-colonial heritage of West Indies. And his mixed ancestry kind of makes him, uh, gives him a wide variety of perspectives, of, uh, you know, makes him aware of the complexities of colonial and post-colonial history, which he brings into his work. So in 1970, in an essay, uh, What the Twilight Says, he say, an overture, he says, discuss, he dis uh, discussing art and theatre in his native region. Okay, so in, uh, as I was saying in his 1970 essay, What the Twilight Says, an overture discussing art and theatre in his native region, uh, Walcott reflects on West Indies as a colonized space. He discusses the problems of an artist from a region with, which has little in way of truly indigenous forms of expression, tr uh, little left of um, indigenous history and culture. So that the national identity or the nationalist identity is kind of, you know, is, is, uh, is formed on this vacuum where the indigenous or the native cultures and history is lost and uh, the, the culture that on which the nationalist identity can fall back is just the colonial history or colonial culture and its exploitative or its, um, yeah, its exploitative dimension. So, how does one, how does an indigenous writer, how does a writer from such a region write and express himself? And if you see these quotes here, 
he is talking about, he is trying to express this dilemma where he says, we are all strangers here. Our bodies think in one language and move in another. So this dichotomy between thought and language, right, expression and experience, where you, what you experience, uh, you know, what you, what your, what you experience, your native experiences, the indigenous, local, regional experiences, but the language that is available for expression is often, uh, you know, language imposed by the colonizer, French or English. So, there is a dichotomy, there is a basic dichotomy between, uh, you are caught between language of expression and then very local indigenous experiences and there is kind of no, uh, the writer feels that the two, the language does not do justice to the uh, regionalized experiences. Uh, this is here, we, uh, here he says, he talks about his poetry and he says that it is almost like a spiritual vocation, a religious vocation to him, it is almost like a prayer. I want you to read this third quote because here he takes slightly positive or an optimistic view of the dilemma that he mentions here, right, of between the experience and between uh, expression. And he says here that there was a great joy in making a world that was so far up to then had been undefined. My generation of West Indian writers had felt such a powerful elation at having the privilege of writing about places and people from the, for the first time and simultaneously having behind them the tradition of knowing how well it can be done by a Defoe, a Dickens, a Richardson. So, uh, here he is, he says, here he is more optimistic and he says that there are new places, there are new expressions, there are new people, there are, new, sorry, there are new experiences uh, that have not been explored and yet we can learn from the style or there is a style that we can, we can, uh, you know, we can know from these great writers of English literature. So he's trying to bridge them together to create uh, to create forms of writing, to create aesthetic forms uh, which borrow from indigenous localized experiences as well as colonial cultural heritage which kind of bridges them together. So he is exploring, so he, he uses these expressions whether it is in play like Dream Monkey or Omeros, he is using these to explore the conditions of post-colonized and post-colonial uh, people under the oppressive forces of powerful colonialism and its aftermath. So coming to Omeros published in 1990, as I said Omeros is a work of an established and a known poem, uh, poet. He's not a struggling writer, he already has a reputation and he has a work experience, uh, he has many, many ex uh, years of experience of writing. So Omeros is a very carefully planned poem, an epic poem uh, that he is writing and he's inspired by Homer's Iliad, right? He's inspired by Homer's Iliad. So he's taking, he is, he has modeled Omeros on Iliad, but there are also other influences like the influence of Dante, he uses terza uh, rima, so the measure is, you know, the way it is written, three line stanzas with, a, that is how the rhyme scheme goes, A, B, A and B, C, B and it goes on C, B, C or C, D, C and uh, that's how it, uh, uh, th that's what Dante uses, terza rima in, uh, uh, in uh, Divine Comedy and that is what Omeros borrows, uh, sorry, that is what Walcott borrows for his epic. And of course, there's lots of allusions to Homeric ap epics like the Iliad and also the Odyssey. So when you read, I hope you have some knowledge of these two. And when you read, you can pick up the allusions. It's a very densely packed poem and it's carrying a lot of history and also history of art. And it constantly refers to art and literature from Europe, from America, so it is constantly, it is extremely intertextual, the poem is extremely intertextual, so in a way it is not just writing, it is not just inspired by Homer, it is not just inspired by English uh, poetic traditions, it is inspired, it is also writing back, you know the whole idea of empire writing back, it is also entering into a dialogue 
or entering into a dialogue yes with these texts it is kind of writing back it is writing uh, with referencing these texts. So, once uh, what I mean is basically inter it is intertextual once you read Omeros uh, you get you know it is you get new kind of references you get new understanding for the uh, other epics. So, in a way Omeros puts itself or Walcott puts this into this tradition of epic poetry. So, it is as I said it is a po epic poem modeled on uh, the uh, Homer on Homeric epics especially Iliad and this is where it is sent Saint Lucia the island of Saint Lucia and here is somewhere it is here somewhere North America South, South America the two continents and the Caribbean islands here and here is Saint Lucia the island also no, known as Lunola by native Arawaks and Hewanora by native Caribbeans. So, these are other names for the islands. So, it was originally inhabited by Caribbean, uh, Nat Caribbean Indians the Arawaks and their uh, cultural practices are referred to in, f in the first book, but when, when uh, this when Omeros is written or when even White Sagasso Sea was written before this, we see that these native tribes, Arawaks, other tribes of Caribbean Indians have disappeared, they are lost and book one refers to their, uh, their disappearance as new race of people takes, takes over the island. Linola basically means land of iguanas, so that is where iguanas are found and uh, Walcott mentions that in book one. Now, because it switched so often between English and French constantly till in it, it uh, till English took control in 1884, the island is also called Helen, right? It is also called uh, Saint Lucia is also called the Helen of the West after the Greek mythological character Helen of Troy, which was uh, you know who was at the center of the battle between Greeks and Tro Trojans. So here because the island had been the center of conflict between English and French, it was metaphorically known as Helen. So, the first Europeans came to this, these islands as pirates, uh, then they were followed by Dutch, French and of course then English. So, it has had different colonial masters, there, uh, it has, there is a constant back and forth, the, the, you know it, the exchange of hands, constant back and forth of authority colonial control. So, yeah as I said it is known as Helen, but also it is important because this creates this constant back and forth uh, between the colonizers also creates a mixed heritage, right. So, uh, the French, the Dutch, the English have all controlled uh, the island over a period at some point of time or the other. Then of course, the African slaves who came to work on the plantations. Uh, so, it has created a mixed heritage, a mixed culture on St. Lucia. Uh, the British of course, uh, the Arawaks as it is referred to in first in the first book of Omeros, Arawaks were there the or inhabitants of uh, the island and British tried to enslave Arawak, but Arawaks were ill suited to the, the you know to to the training that uh, you know that is a euphemism the training that uh, uh, to work on plantations. So, so, Arawaks as I said were unsuited for training and uh, uh, that the British the that the British plantation owners or the uh, you know colonizers subjected them to subjected the enslaved uh, the slaves to. So, the and they were also vulnerable to European disease. So, they could not become the bound labor force and that labor force comes from Africa to replace the narratives who would not or could not be enslaved. So, but the slaves it is not as if the slaves uh, you know slaves settled easily slavery uh, slaves did not thrive either because of harsh conditions, the death rate was high, there is disease and of course, the hot weather. So, it is more or less the same situation as we discussed in White Sargasso Sea, yet the slave import continues till the population of Africans on the island surpasses the number of Europeans uh, and of course, the Caribbean Indians or the Arawaks and other tribes like that disappear. 
So it is the same situation as we discussed in White Cigar. So see the rule of tiny but very powerful and wealthy European elite. Uh, in mid 20th century, St. Lucia joined West Indies Federation and then the colony was dissolved. And when the colony was dis uh, dissolved in 1979, it attained full independence. So that is in a nutshell, that is the history of this little island uh, of West Indies or rather Caribbean islands. So just to give you some idea uh, about uh, the setting of Omeros uh, or the St. Lucia, uh, it is a volcanic island with a number of small islands off the coast and tourism is the mainstay of the economy and uh, culture of St. Lucia has been Afri as I said influenced by African, East Indian, French and English heritage. So, a mixed heritage, uh, it has, but it has, it is a very small island, but it has already had uh, two Nobel Prize, uh, two winners of the Nobel Prize, Sir Arthur Lewis, who won Nobel Prize in Economics in 1979, and then of course, Derek Walcott, who won the one Nobel Prize in Literature in 1992. And here I have just put in these little images, actually these are watercolors done by Derek Walcott himself, the scenes and images of, uh, la on, of the life on St. Lucia. So he's, these are his paintings, um, his watercolors. So uh, as I said, Omeros is an epic right it is an epic poem what is an epic now epic is it is a long uh, according to the dictionary it's a long narrative poem in elevated style recounting the deeds of a legendary or a historical hero so the form it's a long narrative poem it's a it first is a length secondly it's telling a story it's not descriptive it is telling a story and how does it tell a story in a very elevated formal formal style and what is the content of an epic? It is the legend, it is legend, it is a legendary or a historical hero and uh, these are some examples of Greek epics and Roman epics, right? Uh, so the heroes of epic represent cultural values. So the Iliad and the Odyssey are not just about the two heroes, they are about the Greek culture, they represent the cultural values. The stories of wars and battles, these are all like the originary moments. These are the moments which define Greek culture, the, the war, the events that are described in these, two nov uh, in these two epics are seen to be as defining moments of Greek culture, Greek history. So they are supposed to be the originary moments of a community or the founding of a nation. They are supposed to hold that essence of a community and its values. Of course, the setting is vast. I mean, uh, uh, if you see Iliad or the Odyssey, it is the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean uh, or the Greek Isles and so on. But yet, it is represents the world at that time, right? It represents the world at that time. Omeros is different because Omeros, the world has already opened up. So, the world of Omeros is much wider than the world of, world of the Odyssey or the Iliad. Omeros, I mean the, uh, the poem moves from St. Lucia to uh, uh, America, uh, Africa to the to various cities in Europe. So the worst is uh, so, so sorry, so the world is much larger, but the sense that this is the world, right? This is this, this is the world, this is the entirety of known world is common to uh, the epic. So, in Iliad and Odyssey, even though the geographical span might be limited, but there is an awareness that this is the whole world. There is a sense that this is the whole world. Epics are a part of culture's oral tradition and I think here is where uh, Omeros differs from Greek epics or you know other ancient epics because epics have been a part of a culture's oral tradition, right? They have been told and narrated by uh, storytellers, by poets over a period of time. The original text is often in rhyme pattern and uses poetic devices like alliteration, repetition and so on. So this Omeros also uses all these devices 
it begins in media res that is it begins in the middle right in the middle of the action and then we come to know about the past in the later books later chapters and the action the present action follows from there it invokes the invocation to the muse so the 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 vastness of the setting the time the events it they are so larger than life that the poet invoke invokes sorry the poet invokes divine inspiration and that is what it means by invoking the muse so invokes divine inspiration to enable him to do justice in telling this larger than life story and this is these are the things that this this is all that omeros also does and therefore it follows the stylistic tradition of epic poetry however where it is different is that it is not it doesn't start as an oral tradition omeros was written in 1990 right it is it is a part of written uh, poetic tradition it is an epic of written poetic traditions so and it is very interesting that uh you know when he's using remember the themes of uh, remember the themes of uh, omeros is colon, colon, colonization of uh, saint lucia and post colonial culture and society so he is using this western poetic tradition of right of of an epic to push back against western colonialism and create a more uh create an it more integrated society on a smaller on a small caribbean island so it is using these traditions just like just like we discuss in white sagasso see that she that the writer uses an english novel to push back against the depictions of colonized women or colon uh, the colonized in an english novel here we see omera in omeras walcott is using western poetic tradition to challenge western colonialism to question western colonialism and also to create an integrated society on this small island of saint lucia so some some formal features of an epic and you can as i said earlier on you when you read you can try and uh note down the uh, the kind of uh, you can try and note down the parallels in omeros so of course at the center is a battle so iliad is at the center of iliad is a battle between the greeks and trojans over supposedly over helen of troy uh, but their larger it is also a battle of power greed acquisition of territory so but at the yeah, as at the center uh, is a battle and it could be for it could overtly be just for a woman but on a larger scale on a deeper on the, on the bigger picture one needs to look what are the other implications what are the other things that these supposed heroes are fighting for uh in the in the in an epic so epic is the oldest form of literature it in as i said it has it gives valuable insights into culture so when we discuss what iliad and what 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 is the battle in iliad about it also tells it tells us what this culture values uh, in a way so it it can be about honor it can be about proud it could also be read as an epic of greed and power so but we we can kind of know what what greek society and what greek culture valued so it begins with it begins with a great journey often there is a journey into the underworld the, so there is a hero's journey and we saw we see this pattern in lot of literature even the young and adult literature uh that we read uh, that you must have read so hero big goes on a journey there is a call for adventure hero tries to refuse the call and then he finally uh, very reluctantly crosses over the threshold so he separates from his known world and enters into this unknown realm there are various uh, trials initiation trials there are tests uh, he meets goddess a temptress there is uh, he gains new powers and achieves his full potential journeys to the underworld to get 
more uh, to get uh, you know to gain wisdom and knowledge and then finally returns to his own world that he had been separated from so he's kind of rescued he crosses back uh, into the known world and becomes you know comes back as a master of the two worlds so that is a basic that is a very that is the hero story which often lies at the center of the epic sto uh, epic story so there are battles we have battles here we have um, you know wars and so on but actually it is just uh, it is also it is it is also the, the arc of a hero story uh, other formal and formal and stylistic features you would often see people you know a, an account of different people who fought in the battle their genealogies their unique possessions and powers so we often have these and you and when you read omeros try and look for these in the text uh, there is also intervention by the gods right suddenly gods would inter, in, in, uh, intervene and change the course or direct the course of action and of course as i said the language is very formal they are formal extended extended formal speeches so it's not it's it's a very it's it's a uh, it, the epic uh, epic poetry is not everyday poetry. It's an elevate. It uses an elevated formal style. Uh, it it is a story of a culture. It is a story of a culture's hero. Uh, it tells about what a culture values. It value it its value systems, and so on. And as I said, it is it is kind of it's a defining moment in cultural history. The battles, the events that an epic talks about or narrates, are defining moments. Uh, in the in the cultural history okay so coming to omeros now the vast number of characters and vast and and vast number of characters the it, uh, the poem moves over vast geographical regions place to place so it is a little difficult at times to keep uh, you know to keep keep up with various threads of the narrative and there are several writers here you know uh, the Walcott gives space to several writers so it's it's not just uh, sorry several voices several narrators uh, Walcott gives space to several narrators so you have you don't have just one voice binding or putting a st the story together various people come at where come to the fore at various times and the story goes on so it is a vast, it is a single narrative but it is narrated by different speakers or different narrators so these are some of the important characters and they often some of them often take the thread of the story and move it uh, ahead, move it on so the first one is philo the first one is philoctetes he is an elderly fisherman at saint lucia and uh, the important thing about him is uh, in in Omeros that is his wound there is a festering wound on his leg and we begin the story we begin the uh, sorry we begin the epic with that and it becomes it it becomes an important symbol as we go on with the poem now Philoctete is uh, drawn directly he is directly drawn from a Homeric character with the same name who was abandoned on an island by the Greeks because he could not stop screaming from a snake bite and uh, that snake bite the wound is festering on his leg and a, and a prophecy held that Troy can't be conquered till Philoctete is cured of his wound so he's brought back to Troy to finish the war so his wound Philoctetes and his wound is an important symbol or a metaphor in the poem in Omeros as well the other one is Achilles and of course the two Achilles and Hector named after the two Greek heroes in this in this text they are the rival fishermen who are in love with Helen a beautiful Saint Lucian woman who used to work for a white couple called uh, the Plunkets right who own a pig farm at Saint Lucia so major Plunkett he's a British war veteran married to Maud an Irish woman and he is also in love with Helen and Maud Plunkett who is uh, Plunkett's wife he's she's Irish and uh, we get an indication in the text that she's dying she's she is suffering from cancer and she's dying uh, in the text 
So, if you see these names Philoctete, Achilles, Hector, Helen, these are all not African names, these are they are all descendants of Africans who were brought by the Europeans to work in, on St. Lucia, but these are not African names, these are Greek names, but they are common, they are very common in St. Lucia and it is a, a testimony of the colonial practice when they got the slaves, they would rename the slaves. So, the slaves are renamed and they use these names for the slaves brought from Africa. So, in a way, uh, you know, severing them from their cultural roots, severing them from their cultural heritage, from their very name, so cultural identity and imposing a new Europeanized identity over them. And we see it in a way also in White Sagar, so see where Antoinette is renamed Bertha Mason, so kind of imposing a new identity on, uh, on the natives. A seven seas is a blind fisherman and, po and a poet and he is analogous to the figure of Homer, the Greek poet. Aphalib, a slave taken from Africa and we come to know in during the course of the text that he's, he is brought from Africa and he is renamed as Aishuli and he is the ancestor of the present day Aishuli. So, Aphalib is the African slave who is the ancestor of this Greek hero Achilles, uh, sorry this this fisherman named after the Greek hero Achilles. And we also see that you know when contemporary actually when we, we he goes on a dream trip to uh, Africa to his or to his to the land of his ancestors he has and he meets his father, uh, he meets his ancestor Aphalem uh, on the island. And then there is narrator who could be an, uh, who could be analogous to Walcott, but we should not we should not think of him as Derek Walcott himself. He is a character, he is a narrator of the poem, he is a character in the poem. Uh, so, we should not be reading too much of Walcott's biography in the poem, but just to know about the narrator, he is a scholar who shares interest in the history of St. Lucia. He shares that interest with Major Plunkett, with Seven Seas and they are trying to, you know, when, when he is telling the story, Seven Seas or uh, telling the story on Major, when Major Plunkett is writing the history of St. Lucia, uh, the narrator, he, there are often exchanges between these tellers of St. Lucian history. So, uh, as I said due to the vast variety of characters, different geographical locations and also because of different narratives, different narrative threads, it is a little difficult and it is confusing to pick up what is happening, especially if you are not used to reading narrative verse, especially if you are not used to reading epic poetry. So, I am going to give you a little, a quick uh, glimpse of what is there in the books. So, the first book begins with, uh, you know, it begins with this description of the trees being cut in St. Lucia. We see how the landscape is being altered and the, uh, the trees are repeatedly described as the dead gods of St. Lucia. So, the ep and of, uh, the important thing in book one in terms of plot is Hector and actually feud over Helen, they fight over Helen uh, and Major Plunkett decides to write, uh, decides that St. Lucia needs a history, right, the island needs a history of its own. So, this is very interesting that Major Plunkett, a British war veteran decides to write about the history of St. Lucia as these two fishermen. Uh, fight over Helen. So, in book 2 Major Plunkett continues his research over uh, research on history and we see uh, the French and British wars over the islands. So, it is interesting that is why I said that it is interesting that a British war veteran is writing the history of St. Lucia because where does he go to get his history or where does his historical narrative start and that is with French and British war over the islands. We do not really hear about 
uh, pre-colonial history of the Isles. We do not really hear about Arawaks and other tribes. We do not hear about, uh, not much about slaves uh, until unless they are referred to as workers. You know, they, until unless they are, they are a part of colonial narrative. So, anything outside the colonial narrative, how would Major Plunkett uh, access and know that? That is a problematic aspect of Major Plunkett deciding to write, a British war veteran deciding to write St. Lucian history. Of course, Helen leaves Achilles in this plot between Hector, Achilles and Helen. Helen leaves leaves Achilles for Hector who is doing very well in his taxi business. So from, fisherman, from being a fisherman, Hector has now become a taxi driver. Now book 3 I think is a very very important book and uh, maybe you can read this one in detail. Uh, Delirious with sunstroke, Achilles imagines a journey to Africa. So he goes to Africa. Uh, and it is an epic trope of uh, you know the the whole epic uh, convention of going to the under the journey to the under underworld and here Achilles lives his own history here we also see him talking to his father debating about the loss of uh, sorry his ancestor debating about the loss of name so Aphelab to Achilles and Achilles actually means nothing in his African in his ancestral culture so, this whole debate of uh, changing a name which is culturally meaningless. So, book 3 is an important one. Book 4 and book 5 are, so book 4 is a go out, go away from St. Lucia. So, this is in Africa, here we are in America, right, the narrator goes to a campus in New England and muses over the role of African and Native Americans in American history. So, here we have, we are talking about Africans in Caribbean history and this becomes a kind of, you know, this becomes, this leads the narrator to think about Africans and Native Americans and their role in and place in American history. Book 5, narrator visits into various international cities, Lisbon, London, Dublin, Istanbul, Venice, Rome, Boston, Toronto and these all these cities are have been central to the colonial past right all these country cities have been central to the colonial past so whether as colonizers or having faced colonialism uh, they are central to the colonial narrative. The, here the narrative vo voice is taken over by a woman called Catherine Weldon and who is Catherine Weldon I will just we will just uh, discuss that one. I will just let you know. But just to let you know, for a, for a short while, the narrative voice is taken over by a woman called Catherine Weldon. Book 6, Hector dies in a car crash. Uh, Helen returns. So, the plots are resolving in a way. Hector dies in a car crash and Helen returns to Achilles. And we also learn that Maud Plunkett dies of cancer. The book 7, the seventh book or the last book, there is a direct reference to Dante's Divine Comedy. It, it's, you know, it's, uh, the, the narrator and seven seas, the poet, they journey to the hell, they descend to the hell and come out in a paradise. So, Saint Lucia is kind of re-envisioned as a narrator visits the pa hell and comes back. Maud is buried and we know that Helen is pregnant with Hector's child and that in a way for the narrator represents new hope, a new synthesis for St. Lucia. So, this is in a nutshell, this is the plot, but this is a very, this is just a skeletal plot. We do not really get the nuances, we do not really get the complexities just by going over this. So, uh, you should read the entire book, but this kind of clarifies this gives you some idea of what the what are the various narrative threads in Omeros. So, just to put things together the major plot the major uh, plot points the major events happening in Omeros is first of course this feud over Helen 
Major Plunkett and his attempt to research and write the history of Lucia, uh, Saint Lucia that is another important plot. So here we have the uh, here in this plot between sorry this plot between Hector, Achilles and Helen becomes a way to reflect on the African history, African culture that has been transplanted to Saint Lucia. Here we have deliberations on colonizers culture, so British and French wars and you know, Maud Plunkett, we see a lot of Victorian imagery associated with Maud Plunkett. So, uh, so here we have another cultural stand, a strand that makes up for the mixed heritage of St. Lucia. Of course, the wound of Philoctete here, so that is an important uh, symbol or metaphor as I mentioned and as you go on the wound is it's it's almost the, you know he later on he at some point of time says that the wound he got by the man uh, by the chains that his ancestors had when they were being transported from Africa to uh, St. Lucia. So his wound becomes a metaphoric symbol of slavery, of enslavement, of not being of a break between cultural past and the present and that healing of that wound is very important and that the story of healing of that wound is also the story of reclamation of one's cultural past right? and we would discuss that as we go on. And finally, the narrator and his attempts to come to grips with his failed marriage and his epic right now, writing his as he's writing his epic so these are the important plots that come together in this epic poem omeros so the major plot uh, the major uh, threads of the story. So, we follow the breakup of Achilles and Helen, Helen's moving in with Hector, Hector's switch from fisherman to a taxi driver, a cabbie, Helen's attempt to find work and Achilles suffering over the loss of Helen. We follow Achilles as he dives for treasure, as he makes a dream visit to West, uh, to Africa and eventually returns the death of Hector and Helen's pregnancy and her return to Achilles. That's the first one. The second one, as I said, Major Plunkett and his wife and his attempt to write the local history as a part, uh, which is in part as a tribute to Helen's beauty. We learn of Maud's desire to return to England, her preparations for her death and, Major's, uh, and Major Plunkett's mourning for her, of her loss, uh, for her loss and at one point Major and Hector can also confront each other. So, the, so, in a way, the two plots come together, they constantly brush against each other. Now, Philoctete is also, the, the story of his wound is also associated with other characters like Mark Hillman, who runs a local bar called No Pain Cafe, and Seven Seas, the blind bard-like figure, the blind bard-like figure analogous to Homer in this uh, epic poem. And his wound is eventually healed by Mark Hillman, who returns to the African roots to uncover the cure to this wound. And we see, of course, the narrator who meets the ghost of his father twice, once in St. Lucia, once in North America. We follow him on his journey to, Amer to America, to, uh, to where he meets the ghost of Catherine Weldon. He goes to Europe, he visits various cities, the centers of colonial uh, uh, colonial empires uh, and finally makes a dream uh, makes a visit to the underworld so omeros is as much a work about walcott's own poetic consciousness right here it is it's it's a uh, it's a work about poetic consciousness as it is about other stories in saint uh, or other events happening in saint lucia So, some of the key symbols here in uh, that are used and uh, they carry they carry a weight of meaning throughout the poem. So, of course, the figure of Helen who is a, who is a St. Lucian woman, a beautiful St. Lucian woman, the center of the feud, but also Sir Helen as an island that was fought over who also uh, 
Helen is also the name of the island that was that the British and French fought over continuously. So till you know till nearly till the 19th century, late 19th century. So Helen, also Helen of Troy and Helen of St. Lucia, the past and the present. So the figure of Helen links the past and the present, the Western poetic tradition, the epic Western epic poetry and Omeros and of course the colonial, the history of colonialism. She also stands as a, or the figure of Helen also stands as a representative of that. Sea Swift is a very important symbol throughout we see. Uh, now sea, uh, Swift is a very large seabird and because of it is cruciform wind span, you know, winds open almost in, in the shape of a cross. It is often used in Christian symbolism and it is one of the fastest birds and you find them all over the world. So these qualities make, uh, you know, because of these qualities the poet uses them as symbols to link time, place continents and the swift often appears it seems to come and lead people to another world like when Achille goes Achille, Achille goes to Africa. Uh, then of course we have deliberation on history, memory, poetry, how much of it is remembered, how much of it is forgetting, how much <coughs> of it is re remembered. Uh, involuntary and how much of it we have voluntarily forgotten and the need to reclaim one's cultural history. The storytellers are important here, we have various storytellers and there, uh, there is a, uh, this important seven seas who is a poet, who is a blind poet, analogous to the figure of Homer, also Omeros on the island. Then there is a poet narrator who is telling the story, who is a scholar interested in St. Lucian history, then there are uh, they are shamans, they are poets, folk poets and at one point of time we even encounter the ghost of the writer James Joyce when he visits Dublin. The wounds are important here, uh, the wounds are important metaphors, we have of course a very important metaphor, a very famous wound of philosophy, everyone knows about it and everyone wants to heal it. Then there is Plunkett's wound, uh, Walcott's wound, everyone carries some kind of a wound and this wound is a sign of some rupture and so it is a symbol, it is a metaphor for some kind of a rupture that all these people are facing. So Achilles is a rupture from his cultural past that has to heal and so on. Of course land and sea imagery, we, uh, we have that throughout the images of sea and land, the falling, the changing landscape in a way. Uh, the, uh, the, the book that books the poem starts with the changing landscape, the trees being fallen, uh, the trees being cut down, the forests are fallen. So uh, the land also all these images show in a way cultural, they are a way to show cultural land, landscape, a way to show the changing cultural history. The sea is important, it sustains the fishermen, right. Uh, although Hector changes from being a fisherman to becoming a cabbie, a taxi driver, he is never really happy and it is almost as if he has left his essence behind because sea is a great giver of life uh, often but uh, sea is also about you know deliver the imagery also uh, deliberates on history and amnesia, uh, remembering and forgetting as it is etched on the landscape. We meet and encounter various ghost figures, Afolabe, Achilles, uh, Achilles uh, ancestor, the narrator's father, we meet the ghost of Catherine Weldon and of course famously James Joyce and the gods, not just we mostly yeah, we in the, the book starts with the trees being described as gods, but we also hear about African gods, Greek gods and the swift you know Christian gods especially in the symbol of this bird sea swift. So we, uh, so before you go ahead and read it, just to sum up, uh, Omeros is an epic. It's a, it's an epic about Saint Lucia. It's a story of a culture. And remember what he said about 
you know, vast, uh, vast places and la play people not having been written out of the colonial history. So, Walcott is writing an epic poem, uh, you know, an epic about the people who have been written out of colonial history and literature. So, it's an epic poem focusing on people who have been written out of colonial history. It is vast in terms of setting and space, but it also, it is also important, it is localized at the same time because it's placing St. Lucia in this history of colonialism, the world history of colonialism. Of course, the symbolism, the continuous symbolism, the use of uh, you know, the bird imagery, it all follows from epic traditions. The, the story is about the creation of new community, right? The coming, the story of this new St. Lucian community. So, uh, so, it is a story about this culture that is coming into being as we read, as we, as he writes the poem. And of course, then these formal features of the epic in various parts of Omeros. So, in a way, we can just say Omeros is, is a story or is an epic, just like an epic, Greek epic, which is about Greek culture. Omeros is an epic about St. Lucian culture. It is, as I said, the creation of a new community, which is, uh, which is attempted at, but you know, when Philoctete att attempts to win elections at some point of time, I think in book three or four, but it does not really happen. It happens towards the end when the history has been reclaimed. So, Helen's baby represents a way forward. Mark Kilman healing Philoctetes wound represents a way forward. So, it is by going into the past that new community can come into being. And in that light, please try and read invocations that, uh, uh, that Walcott uses in these books and chapters, the epic catalogues, just, uh, just, uh, just read these and look at how they, they are different from Iliad and Odysseus, Odyssey. So, now with these things in mind, you can start reading Omeros. We will discuss certain excerpts from Omeros as we go on with these uh, sessions. Thank you.